Well, good morning, everybody. I trust you've had a good week and you're doing well. Today is Resurrection Day, my preferred term for Easter Sunday. It's all to do with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So may I start this service by saying, Christ has risen. And you know, even though we're distant from each other, here's a little refrain that I'm sure you know only too well. I'm going to say Christ has risen, and you can say risen. he has risen indeed. So let's do that again. Christ has risen, he has risen indeed. Christ has risen, he has risen indeed. That's a great thing to say at the very beginning. What a positive affirmation of the truths we as Christians hold to. Before we pray, I want to say a few things. First of all, I believe that we need more than ever a risen saviour. Only the other day I was looking at the Barnabas Fund's website that helps persecuted Christians all around the world. What a sterling work they do. And I was just really quite mesmerised by the numbers of categories and groups of people who need support in this world. Major thing. I look at our country. I look at the world in general. I look at our churches and individual Christians I know, and obviously beyond that. And you know, I'm going to say it again. We so need a risen saviour. But you know, we've got one. And his name is Jesus. And he is alive today. And there is so much hope in that truth, in the truth of his resurrection. I say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Hopefully by the time I finish this talk today, we'll see how incredibly important the resurrection is. And actually, we've got nothing without it. So before I pray, Here's a little bit of a background for us. It was to the churches in Corinth in Greece that Paul was writing. He was in Ephesus at the time that he wrote this letter to the ch church at Corinth. And it was by AD 55 that he'd got the letter completed and sent to them. But the interesting thing is this. In Corinth, there were many issues and matters that had come up. And one of them was to do with whether or not the bodily resurrection was a possibility for believers. So that's why this passage, albeit not the most usual one on Resurrection Sunday, is the one I've chosen. Because there was a false teaching in Corinth saying there was no re resurrection at all and Paul needed to respond to it. And we're going to see what a great argument he made and why it's so important for us today. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, on this day, this Resurrection Sunday, we praise you that Jesus is alive. He's risen from the dead and he is in power right now. The person called Jesus is full of life. And we thank you that we can celebrate that every day, not just today. Lord, we ask that you bless your word to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. So as we go through the passage now, first things first. If there is no resurrection, then there are a number of very deeply concerning consequences because of that. The first one is this. If there's no bodily resurrection, as some were teaching in Corinth at that time, then logically, and it is logically, Jesus himself could not have been raised either. Verse 13. And if he has not been raised, then how can he, as still a dead man, return to earth and complete the salvation work that he's already started in our lives? It's a major thing, a major thing. If there's no resurrection, then logically all that I've said is true because the two things are linked and locked together. Can you imagine the following scenario? If there is no resurrection, then Jesus is still dead and his bones are somewhere in a tomb or a cave and they have been there for 2,000 years. 
My friends, the weight of that, the magnitude to believe that that is the case is actually terrifying. 500 plus people saw him physically risen from the dead sometime after, of course, he was put in the tomb. 500 plus people, incredible witnesses, saw him physically alive. And the church has always taught physical resurrection ever since its conception. So I say our refrain today with conviction, Christ has risen, he has risen indeed. The second point is this, if there is no bodily resurrection, then I might as well just go home. Shall I switch off the camera? No point in me saying anything. What would be the point of me preaching about a dead man? Verse 14, what can a dead man even do? What difference would a corpse in a tomb somewhere make to the generation in 2021? We know the answer to that is nothing. There's no way a dead Christ can do anything. But the truth is, my friends, even on a bad day, my preaching is not useless verse 14 because Christ has risen he has risen indeed our third point moreover if Christ has not been risen well here is a sobering truth to ponder not just would my my, my preaching be useless if that were the case but so would your faith and that word useless literally means empty, void, worthless, null, amounting to zero, and thus of no value or profit. That would be the sort of faith you and I would have if the resurrection were not true. That's what non-resurrection means for our faith and our teaching and our preaching. Indeed, Further to that, we would also be false witnesses, charlatans, telling people a lie. Verse 15, but we are not charlatans. We are truth speakers because Christ has risen and we know he is physically alive. So we say it again, Christ has risen. He has risen in well, as is always the case in my sermons, it seems, there's some more things in here we need to consider. And the fourth one is this. The consequences of not believing in the resurrection of Jesus because we regard it to be something that's not true. Well, here's Paul's logic and progression in his argument further still. The next one is this, a strong word. Your faith is futile, verse 17. And that word futile, you know, it's got a range of meanings, but here are some. It is a faith that is without purpose or ground, and it's absent of anything worthwhile. It is in vain, and thus it is without profit, because it is without basis. That is what our faith would be like if Jesus is still dead. And the fifth one, but more than that, and how concerning is this? And this is one that personally is so important to me. If Christ has not been risen, we are still in our sins. Verse 17b. Without resurrection, you and I, figuratively speaking, are still living in the realm and sphere of sin. You're still in the same condition and state as you were before. For me, as I said, this is such an important area. You see, for me to know that everything I have ever done wrong, and believe me, I have done a lot wrong in my life. For me to know that everything I've ever done wrong, all those times when I did not love God properly with all my mind, heart, soul and strength, and that list of things stacked against me, for all of that to still be unforgiven is desperately desperate, certainly for a person like 
me. But today, I stand, or rather I sit, and I say, I am forgiven because Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. And I need him. And the sixth thing, without resurrection, those who have already died, which the Bible calls fallen asleep, which is the term in our passage, all those who have already died are lost if Christ has not been risen. More literally, they have completely perished away to nothing. Can you imagine what a catastrophe that would be? You'd never be able to see your loved ones again. They would be gone forever. No wonder then, Paul says, if only in this life we have hope, we are to be more pitied or regarded as more wretched than all men. Verse 19. But ABC, Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. I want to say just for a few moments that without Jesus, I don't really have a true identity. But with Jesus, I'm a new creation. Old has gone and the new things have come. Because of Jesus, I'm called a holy one in him. Because of Jesus, I'm called a saint. Because of Jesus, I'm a friend of God rather than an enemy. Because of Jesus, I'm justified, I'm reconciled, I'm set free, and I can approach the throne of grace boldly. Because of Jesus, because he's alive, my sins are forgiven. It is because of Jesus that one day I'll see my dad again. It's because of Jesus being risen that I'm alive to Jesus and I'm alive to God. It's because of Christ on this resurrection day that you and I can know that we have a, can have a relationship with the living God. And it is because of this fundamental truth that our preaching and our teaching and the things we say to people about Jesus is always glorious, never useless. And you know, I'll say on that for a moment. Maybe you tremble in your boots when it comes to telling people about Jesus, but I want to tell you now, even if you are a bit of a trembler, and I know I can be, don't worry, because what you're saying is still glorious, even if your knees are knocking. Stumbling words don't matter, my friend. Just tell them about the resurrection. That's what they need to know. Repentance, sin, death, resurrection. Because we're into life. We're into the life of a living God who makes a difference. I think so many people need resurrection truth. Actually, it's the only thing they really have got, even though they may not know it. Yes, they need repentance from their sins, but we mustn't forget the life dimension of what the power of the resurrection does in a person's life. And for me, ABC, you know what resurrection is? It's hope. It's hope. And that is why everything I've said to you today is for me, it's for you, it's for those right out there, because resurrection is about the hope that we all so need. And it is why we must tell others about the Lord. Resurrection, you know, it means we can be made alive. Verse 22. We can be more literally enlivened, diffused through with the total and complete spiritual life of God. Therein, my friend, is hope, is it not? And on that great day, he who is the first fruits of resurrection, Jesus, will give us resurrection too, because we belong to him. Verse 23. And then you know what? The miracle is going to happen. And the miracle is this. First, you'll know God in a way you've never done before. It will be wonderful. Total presence of Jesus. But there'll be no illness, no physical illness, no mental illness. We will have bodies completely and fully energised by the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, to put it that way. 
and it's because of Jesus. So Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. So that's Paul's argument. He's worked his way through to show why believing in the resurrection and the fact of the res resurrection is so important. But there's one final thing I want to say. One final thing about the resurrection, and it, it's, it's this in verses 24 to 25. Resurrection also means total victory and total conquest. And in those two verses, here's a few things I'd like to say. First of all, God has always reigned with total and complete power. There's never been a nanosecond in history when God was not in charge, sovereign and in control of everything. But with the resurrection of Jesus, he has proved to the entire spiritual world and the spiritual realm, angels and demons and men and women alike, who he, God, really is. So therefore, to sum it up, a phrase I think I was given, resurrection is also revelation. It reveals who God really is. The second thing. Jesus is going to reign, not just spiritually, but physically. And he's going to do that after his second coming. So based on these verses, when Jesus returns to earth again, he will set up his kingdom on earth, which will last for 1000 years. And that's called the millennium, something you find in the book of Revelation chapter 20. And during that millennial reign, it is then we will see the final crushing of all evil powers, demonic or otherwise. As verse 25 reads, for he must reign. Literally, it is inevitable that he must reign. And as he does, everything will be under his feet, which is an Old Testament way of saying Everything that's evil is trampled under his feet, crushed and pushed down. Victory and authority is what Jesus has. And Psalm 110 verse 1 would be a classic verse to show that in the Old Testament as well. So he will destroy all dominion, all authority and all power and even death itself, all of it, will go under his feet because everything is in subjection to him, as it says in Ephesians 1. And it's because he is the God of resurrection, verses 25 to 26. Everything then that is evil throughout all history, including all the end times horrors that are logically part of this historical period, all of it will be vanquished because of the power of the resurrection of Jesus. And then when done, the end will come. Verse 24, part A. And at that moment, then he will finally hand over his kingdom to God the Father. And it is my personal belief that after this millennial kingdom has happened and Jesus hands it over to Father God, it's then the new heavens, the new earth and the new Jerusalem will come. Hallelujah, because it's even better then, if it could be, but it is. ABC, I really have tried today to just bring alive the wonder of what resurrection means for Jesus himself and, of course, for us as believers. I've tried to also bring alive the truth of it and how incredibly important it is that our friends, our families, our neighbours know of this truth. I think 1 Corinthians 15 is the most precious piece of scripture and we'd be very lacking without it. But what an extraordinary thing resurrection is. What would we have without it? Where would we be? Everything, my friends, doesn't it? Hinges on it. The whole universe and its future depends and hangs on the resurrected God man. And without it, we'd have nothing left but chaos 
and annihilation. That's how important it really is. So on Resurrection Day, Easter Sunday, ABC, may I please urge you, never ever lose sight of resurrection. Don't let it just be a Christian concept in your head or obviously in mine, but let it be a truth that permeates the whole of your person, just as its truth and its reality permeates heaven itself right now. Resurrection Day, in a changing world and where there is a changing church, I'm sad to say, I want to ask us to grab hold of and grasp onto this truth of resurrection and like never before and never let it go, for everything depends on it. And I refuse to throw away the one hope we truly have, no matter what man might say to me. Hallelujah, Jesus is alive. We are resurrected in and through Jesus. And there's even a resurrection life within us now because it doesn't just happen then, it happens now through his Holy Spirit. Romans 6 would be a classic passage to look about, at about that. So Jesus is alive. Yes, I conclude and say our refrain today, Christ has risen, he has risen indeed, and he shall return. God bless you and thanks for your time.